Hello ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kevin and welcome back to Learning the Spire. To begin, thank you all for the love on the last video. I was shocked but ecstatic to hear about how many amateur Spire Slayers there are. I hope my insights prove helpful in turning you into veteran Spire Slayers. Last episode, which can be found by clicking the annotation to the top right, discussed what stays constant for every run up the Spire. Today, however, we will scratch the surface of the many variables that make this game so open-ended and addictive. For every great journey, there is a single step to start it off. Slay the Spire is no different in this regard, and starts chucking information at you right from the jump. In this essay, I'll be discussing everything you need to know about the preliminary floor and how to begin planning your trip to the heavens. Let's begin. As soon as you click Embark, you are surrounded with visual and audio stimuli. The music of the Exordium fills your ears with a soft, daunting string and horn ensemble. Cold, hard, stone floor, peppered with underlying earth, is your only grasp to reality. You're in a wood-clad, walled room, the only source of hope being the lit torches painting the walls in their own act of defiance, or maybe premonition, as to the hell that awaits. But you're not alone. Your character stands confidently juxtaposed to a giant, multi-eyed, scarred and bruised whale, uttering a single phrase. This phrase varies from run to run, but has a general theme of you being here before. This whale, who we later learn to be named Niu, is the Ancient of Resurrection. So you're staring down a primordial god, NBD. She spares you for now, and even asks your aid. The lore tells us very little, excluding that Niu has beef with the Spire, and you're going to be her hitman. This is probably the sanest part of this game. Before even clicking talk, we get our first bits of info to study. In the top right of the user interface, we have the most valuable pieces of this puzzle. Our deck and our map. Oh yeah, the options button is up there too, but I highly doubt changing the volume of the spire is canon. Crank that shit though. Composer Clark Abowd did a top-notch job on this game. Anyway, step one on the zeroth floor is always checking your map. This gives a detailed look as to what you must face on your ascent. The legend to the right tells us that there are six different types of encounters in our way, with 16 floors to populate them. There are four constants in every Act 1. Your first encounter will always be a basic enemy encounter, denoted by the gremlin-looking face without horns. Your last encounter of the Act will always be one of the three Act 1 bosses, the ninth floor will always contain a treasure chest, and there will be no more than three merchants in the entire act, excluding ones that you find in unknown rooms. Excluding that, your floors could be any combination of other encounters, merchants, elite enemies, those being the gremlin-looking faces with the horns, treasure rooms, rest sites, or unknown encounters. These unknown encounters can include normal enemy encounters, random events, merchants, or even treasure rooms. They will never contain elites. For our more experienced scalers, that being those who've slain the spire at least once with each character, you will also see an elite enemy with fire around them. In an effort to not spoil anything, I won't disclose what these are. Word from the wise, avoid them, unless you know what they are and plan to do something with their gifts. Here is where planning begins, and where learning our deck is invaluable. We can form a spectrum of the characters from most consistently offensive to most consistently defensive. This will determine our first path choice. If you're the Ironclad, taking a more encounter-heavy route is valuable, since he already deals a good chunk of damage and heals after each combat. However, taking only encounters leaves us with a bunch of cards and no relics. Sprinkle in a few unknown rooms and elites to round out your archetype. I'll be discussing the preparation for elites in more detail in a coming episode. If you're the silent, take encounter tiles with the grain of salt they deserve. Sure, you can block against the incoming assault, but you won't see another floor until someone's HP is reduced to zero. Act 1 is also notorious for having heavy scaling damage encounters. 
The Cultist gains 3 strength per turn after turn 1, and Jawworm has a 45% chance every turn to gain 3 strength, but not twice in a row. By the way, these figures are courtesy of the Slay the Spire reference, an amazing spreadsheet displaying every enemy and their attack set. Link will be in the description. Back to the Quiet Gal, get cards when necessary, but focus on bolstering your existing cards over adding new ones. Fat Deck Syndrome is a real problem for the Silent, more so than the other two characters. If you are the Defect, things get tricky. You are an animal at defeating low HP enemies with Zap and Dual Cast, and you could still deal damage without playing attacks via your Lightning Orbs. However, Zap and Dual Cast is a two card combo, meaning you'll need to draw both cards in that order. You're guaranteed to draw both in two turns only in your first encounter, assuming you pick a card floor one. You'll need some amount of consistent damage to round out your burst potential, and some amount of block to keep that damage coming safely. Defect's success usually lies in taking about a 50-50 split in encounters and other rooms. These are all generalizations though. If you're low on HP, that being somewhere between 1 and 20 to 30-ish, again, depends on the character, don't fight an elite, no matter how good you think your deck is. A good rule of thumb is to only take on an elite if you're confident in your deck and above 35 hit points. If your deck is already amazing and your HP is high, don't take a rest site. Look at your deck constantly and decide how easy or risky it will be to take on another encounter. Just know that every skipped encounter or merchant could have been a powerful asset to your repertoire. Every skipped elite leaves you bereft of the relic and gold in store, and every skipped rest is one fewer upgraded card or a vital heal. Weigh your options, take your losses, and work with what's available. You can only predict the Spire's intentions to an extent, but you can mold the hand you're dealt to force the Spire to up the ante. Enough planning. Let's talk to Niu. Every run, Niu will give you one of her blessings to assist you in completing her morally ambiguous quest. On your first run, and every run where you fail to reach the Act 1 boss, the options will be the same. Either enemies in your next three encounters have one hit point, giving you the relic Niu's Lament, or max HP plus 10%, rounded down. Niu's Lament seems like a flashy way to start a run, but be cautious of it at first glance. I suggest only taking it if you have the opportunity to lower an elite encounter to one hit point. This turns that seemingly simple blessing into gain 40 to 60 gold, three cards, a relic, and skip your first three encounters. Anyone would pick that option. You should too. Otherwise, it's not awful, but plus 10% HP is usually better. Don't forget that rest sites heal you for 30% of your max HP. If your max is higher, Every rest you encounter for their entire run is better. Maybe only 2-3 to three hit points per rest better, but you only need one hit point to survive an encounter. Better rests mean fewer rests. Fewer rests mean more upgrades. You see where this is going. Every run where you do make it to the Act 1 boss's floor, not necessarily kill them, you will receive four blessing options upon your next run. In an effort to not make this video six hours long, I've taken a screenshot of every possibility. Feel free to pause the video here to read them more in depth. This is per the official Slay the Spire wiki, and a link to that will be included in the description as well. Thank you to them for their dedication. The fourth option is always the same. Trade your starting relic for a random boss relic. The more I play, the more I feel this is a meme option, since the boss relics can mostly be seen as side grades to the starting ones. The only character I would suggest taking this into serious consideration with is the Silent, since her starting relic is the same as another common relic, Bag of Preparation. However, it is a valid option. I would only suggest picking it if the other options don't tickle your fancy. This is every piece of information that we can learn on the zeroth floor of Slay the Spire. If you learned anything new or have any more questions about this topic, drop it in the comments. If you like my take on this information, or just enjoy my luscious voice, don't hesitate to drop a like on the video or consider subscribing. If you want to see me die over and over and over again, live, check me out on Twitch. 
Next episode, we'll be taking a look at the first act more in depth and take our first steps towards victory. Until next time, I've been Kevin, and may RNGesus bless you. Good night.